We're here at the Pat Rafter Arena to chat to Australia's most relatable sports star, Ash Barty. World number one in tennis, French Open champion, and one of the most genuine and humble athletes that I've ever met. Barty, thanks for joining me on One Plus One. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I feel very privileged to, to be f a part of such a small group. Mate, we're here in front of the Pat Rafter Arena. It's a, uh, it's a little bit uh, more refined than a tennis court that you first started playing tennis on. Very much so. Uh, it's, it's a court that I have so many good memories, uh, obviously playing in here in Pat Rafter Arena and pushes me to, to try and be better every single day. But um, knowing as well how far I've come from, from my original club uh, in West Brisbane, it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing court. But the original club, is it true that it was next door to a chicken farm, that you'd have to both hit balls and the, the occasional stray chook? Um, not just next to a chicken farm, it was a chicken farm. Um, so the, the house and my coach, Jim, and his brother um, grew up on the house. It was on the land that, that the tennis courts were at. And so we had five tennis courts, um, big kind of backyard paddock that turned into a chicken coop. Um, so yeah, my, my latter years of playing at, there at the tennis club, uh, we certainly had uh, chooks, there was the occasional sheep, there were dogs, there were, it was carnage. I, I absolutely loved it. When did you fall in love with tennis? I think it was my very first lesson that I had um, at, at West Brisbane Tennis Centre. I remember my first lesson. It was a, a week before my fifth birthday. Uh, it was just a group lesson on a Saturday morning. Um, I was with you know, six or seven other kids, and I just remember the first ball that I hit, and it was just fun. Like, it was just fun. That 45-minute lesson, um, I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. You know that I only asked that question because I want to show that picture. Oh, it's a shocker. <laughs> oh, that picture haunts me. Um, yeah, it's a shocker, but, I mean, I, I hate it, but I love it, because when I look at it, I can't help but smile, and I can't help but, but think in that period of my life how, how happy I was and just how much I genuinely loved playing tennis. The first flight that I took away on, uh, on tour, away from my family, I was uh, 14 or 15 years old. I remember getting on the flight, my mum saying goodbye to me, and uh, the nerves, the excitement, the fear, the anticipation. Do you remember the first time that you were leaving your family to become the professional that you are? Yeah, I think early on, um, I travelled a lot with my dad. Um, we, we drove to a lot of places and domestically he would travel with me whenever we could, but I think it really kind of hit me my first international, um, international flight. I had no idea what was going on. You know, it's, it's all new, going through customs, getting all of your, your bags ready to go to a different country. It's kind of, it's the unknown. And like you said, it's, you've got a little bit of that fear. You've, it's exciting, there's the anticipation. It's, there's so many things that come into it and so many different feelings, but uh, I feel like that week for me, it was, it was over to New Zealand. Um, so it was a really close, but it felt so far away. Um, and that kind of two week um, tour was filled with so many different ups and downs, uh, so many different feelings. A lot of it, I feel like I've tried to block out in a sense where I don't wanna go back and think too much about it because there was a lot of time where I was miserable. But I do remember that that first taste of inter international competition, uh, I love straight away. How is the culture of tennis? Because you're a, you were a young kid in a world where there were set professional adults. How does that mix? I had to uh, grow up very quickly, very quickly. Um, and I think part of me loved it and part of me also missed having a bit more of a normal childhood, whatever that may be. Everyone's different and everyone has a different journey and a different path. But I missed hanging with my friends, going to school, uh, and kind of all the, all the little things that, that you just do as a kid. Um, but double-edged sword, um, you know, 
I also had the most amazing young career, the most amazing people around me, and I think uh, a person in particular who helped me through that was Casey. So that was uh, Casey Delacqua? Yes. Because I would have been 14 when I first met Casey, and that was when I was starting to travel internationally a lot more. Um, was playing probably 30 weeks a year away from home when I was 13, 14, 15. Um, so it was, it was a lot to take on, but I got to spend a lot of that time with her and she'd been on the tour for a long time at, at that point and had gone through ups and downs of injuries, had some fantastic results, had tough weeks and, and kind of knew how to, to go with it all. Um, you know, take it in your stride and it's, it's, not, all, it's not all a beautiful um, kind of ascent to the top. There's twists and turns and, and everything in the way. So I, I knew that I could trust Casey in giving me the right advice and kind of almost holding my hand through that and guiding me in the right way. How do you deal with school? You're 14 years old, you're away for 30 weeks a year. How do you, how do you, how do you deal with the day-to-day -day realities of life at that point? I loved school, I really did. And I think I, I kind of got to a point in school, I, must, I think it was about grade eight. Um, I, was still, I was still going to school all the time and just training in between. And, and then in grade nine, there was a bit of a, a switch where I came almost more as a full-time tennis player and just went to school on the occasional day and was doing distance, distance education. And I, then I kind of turned and I didn't love it as much. Um, I, I lost touch with, you know, sitting in a classroom, listening to a teacher, learning and, and touching and feeling and, and kind of getting all these things instead of just looking at a textbook or a computer and trying to filter through that information. I, I struggled to learn that way. There was a couple of years there where I missed um, the enjoyment of school and I think it, it kind of drove me away from it a little bit. We're going to go to the 18-month hiatus that you had away from tennis. Why? Uh, in short, um, I think I needed just to find myself a little bit. I felt like I got um, twisted and maybe a little bit lost along the way in, in the first part of my career, just within myself and um, mentally what I wanted to do. Um, I was very lucky to have a lot of success, but I'm, I'm still very much a homebody. And I kind of lost my way a little bit with not being able to, to connect with my family. Um, I even, it, I think kind of disconnected we, with my family in a way. We didn't have the same conversation. We didn't have the same um, depth of conversation or, or kind of, we didn't, we didn't lose that love or that care. But for me, I, I just kind of felt like there was a bit of a split and there was a bit of a fork. And, uh, I wanted to come back to that. Um, I wanted to, to come back to my family and, and come back to those who love me the most. Was it too much success? Uh, winning a junior Wimbledon title, that doesn't... Not every kid has to deal with that. It was. At just 15 years old, she'd taken the trophy for the best female player at Wimbledon under 18. I still, to this day, um, junior Wimbledon was the best thing that ever happened to me and it was also the worst. Um, it was far too much too soon, um, but it also gave me a taste of, of what it felt like to be at one of the world's best place, uh, to be surrounded by the best. And once you get a taste of that, it's, it's like nothing else I've ever felt before. Even just walking into Wimbledon for the first time, walking into the All England Club was just remarkable. So you, during that period of time, you decided to pick up a cricket bat? <laughs> She was seen as the next big thing in Australian tennis. A terrific passing shot here under pressure. Now Ashley Barty is swapping her carbon fibre rackets and big money opportunities to play semi-professional cricket for the Brisbane Heat. So I just needed to come home. Um, I was on the road a lot and I just wanted to come home and enjoy some time with my family. Um, it was actually through a, a mutual physio who had worked in tennis previously and I had about seven or eight months off completely and was just doing a bit of coaching and just kind of chilling out at home, just, just doing my thing. And, and then um, the physio at the time had, had moved to cricket and then went to one of the Queensland sessions, met the coach there and um, couldn't help myself but, but pick up a bat. And, and then, yeah, I just kind of went the next week and the next week and the next week and it just kind of filtered in until um, I was almost a little bit part of the group. You said uh, you found yourself in that period of time. What did you learn about yourself in that period of time? Yeah, lots, lots yeah. and lots and lots. And I think in um, all different areas, um, not just about myself personally, but my relationships with my family um, improved, my relationship with myself improved. Um, I met a lot of different people in cricket um, who kind of had that, this different upbringing, this different perspective um, about sport. And obviously at that time, cricket was still very much semi-professional. Um, 
So girls were working full-time jobs, training, and um, that made me really appreciate what I had had before I stopped playing in tennis, just that little bit more. I felt like I was always very um, appreciative of, what, of the opportunities that I'd had, but that was just another, just an, another level. There was a moment in my career where I thought I was done. Uh, as sports psych Fiona, she sat me down and, and put everything back into perspective. It almost reminded me of why I loved the sport in the beginning. Did you have a moment like that? Uh, I think indirectly, yes. Uh, I think it was a little bit more progressive, um, but it was more the time I went down to, to see Casey, just down, down to Sydney to catch up with her. I hadn't seen her in a long time. We were having, having a beer and we were just having a barbecue out the back. And um, yeah, there was just something about that conversation. I'm like, oh, I, miss, I miss Case. Uh, I miss testing myself. I miss competing. I miss trying to bring out the best of myself. And I think part of me as, as an athlete and as a competitor, um, I really missed trying to have that feeling of fulfilment when you know you've done all the work, you know you've done all the preparation, and then it's just about having a crack. Then it's just putting yourself out there and having a go. Uh, and I really, really miss that. And I felt like in, in my career, this second phase of my career, I've done that a hell of a lot better than I did at the start. Your coach said that when you did came back, come back, uh, you were incredibly motivated. Where does that drive for excellence come from? I think it was about learning, learning about the opportunity um, and, and almost being um, more grateful for and more appreciative of the, of the opportunity that I had. Um, obviously, I, I love to work hard, but I understand that tennis has always come quite naturally to me. So I, I didn't want to not feel like I was a wasted talent, but I didn't want these, these voices and people saying I was a wasted talent. A part of me wants to, to prove people wrong, um, but also to prove myself right, that I know that I can do it. And I think um, when we started coming back, we started from scratch. We had no ranking, we had nothing. And part of me felt really comfortable knowing when I went and asked Ties if, if he wanted to, to work with me, that he jumped at the opportunity as well and we both understood what it was going to take, and then we just got to work. You didn't have to lose that ranking, though, did you? You had the opportunity to freeze your ranking at 120, but you chose to, you chose to let it all go at that point when you were taking your time off. Yeah, at the time, I'd said, um, obviously, Casey knew, my family knew, um, my, my team knew, and, and then I had to tell the WTA and, and let them know, obviously, um, and there was an Australian supervisor at the time working working the US Open, and she came up to me and said, Ash, you can take a protected ranking. Um, you know, if you want to, it can it can be an injury, it can be something, it can be whatever it is. And I said, no, 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 if it, I don't want to lie about it. Um, for me, I, I need to, to reset. I need to completely reset. And that was a bit of a challenge in itself, saying if I wanted to play again, I didn't close the door and say I definitely didn't want to, I definitely did, it was just the option. Um, if I wanted to, it was from scratch, it was my way, it was a complete restart, refresh, and part of me saw that as a challenge as well. So you wanted to, if you were coming back, you were going to have to come back from step one? Correct, and, and kind of literally, you have to play a, a professional tournament and win a match to, to be, to have a ranking. To, to be a tennis player. Right? Correct, um, so part of me, maybe without even knowing it, um, when I did decide to stop, kind of left that door open and almost like a little dangling carrot there saying, if you want to do this, you've got to do it properly right from the start. Um, no ifs or buts about it. What do you love about the process of tennis or the game of tennis when you've crossed the white line? Uh, I love the tactical side. Uh, I really do. And I love sitting down with my coach and going, OK, this is, this is me, this is my opponent, and this is how I'm going to dissect my opponent. It, it may only be two or three things, um, but then it's like, okay, let's go to work. That's, that's what I love. I love the preparation of, of training, the phase of getting training to then moving into competition phase, um, getting your body right, getting your mind right. And then once you cross over that white line, it's just go, it's just compete, it's just play. And then it's, there's no guarantees. Um, you can do all the work, have the perfect build up, but it just doesn't happen. Or it can flip the other way. It can be horrible, you feel uncomfortable, you don't feel like you're ready. And then, you know, some pretty special things can happen. So I love that almost uncertainty of what happens when the competition mode flicks on. I, I love that that's what you said. Because <laughs> <laughs> in uh, racing a marathon, the thing that I enjoyed more than racing the marathon was 
racing the competitor and fitting, figuring out how you, how you beat them. You yeah. know, like it, it would become less about winning the race and more about figuring out how I can be the best, how I can beat that person right there. So you're more, you're more competitive than you are a lover of the process. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's, that's kind of what I love about tennis. And I think that's what drew me back to tennis was the one-on-one. -on -one. You're just trying to beat the, the girl down the other end. Um, and sometimes it might be with your tennis that you, you outplay them. Other times you might outthink them. Other times you might outphysical them. There are so many different elements and so many different ways to win a tennis match. Um, and I think it, it also kind of shows there are a lot of ways to stay in a tennis match. And, you know, it, it's kind of a, a bit of a to and fro, but I, I love that one-on-one. -on -one. For the first time in nine years, Australia has a French Open finalist. <laughs> Ash Barty. It's incredible, it really is. And now that we're here, it's, it's about enjoying it, embracing it and having fun. To have made it through to this final stage at Roland Garros is a huge moment for Ashley Barty, especially when you consider she only returned to professional tennis three years ago after taking a break to pursue her other sport, cricket. Often when you're going into the biggest stage, the, the nerves, the anxieties of uh, the, the pre-match, the call room, the moments before you go out on stage, they can be the most excruciating. Can you, you your coach mentioned that you had a unique warm-up for the final. <laughs> we did. Um, because of the rain that had um, affected the tournament, um, the men's semi-final was still playing the morning of our final. So I think it was uh, Novak and Tiam were, had to finish off their semi-final. So we were always going to be a little bit delayed in the start, potentially. Um, and we were just mucking around in the gym. And they went an extra set. So we're like, oh, stuff, we'll, we'll play a bit of cricket. So we get a foam roller out that sands is the wicket. Um, I whip out a little googly ball that we've got, a little reaction ball. And um, then we, I think we are using, it may have even started with like the handle of a racket, um, holding the head of the racket and just using the handle. And then it just turned into like a wooden stick. and as the bat, um, and we're all, we're all in there playing cricket in the gym. So physio, coach? I had my physio, my trainer, um, a hitting partner that was with us, a couple of friends that had come over that were in, in Europe at the time, um, and it was just fun. Like, my agent was there, it was, just, it was just a lot of fun, and time went really quickly. And then when it was go time, I was like, oh, OK, let's go, grab a bag, and off we go. We didn't have a lot of time to sit down and think about it, um, which 100% helped me. Do you remember the moment where you knew that you had just won the French Open? That's the only point of the match that I remember. Really? Yeah, that's, that's the only point um, that I like, completely remember with, with the return, uh, the forehand and then the smash. And I remember thinking I almost screwed up that smash. I got so <laughs> close to it underneath. I was you know, only a metre from the net. And I was like, oh, my positioning here is so wrong. But I remember I'm like, it just kind of in a way, just commit, just hit it, just hit it. Um, and that's the only point I remember in the whole match. She's done it. Ashley Barty wins her maiden Grand Slam singles title and it comes here in Paris at Roland Garros. What does it feel like to think back on it? Um, it doesn't feel real, still. It, it kind of felt like, because I think that whole match is a bit of a blur, kind of the lead up to that moment is a little bit lost. Um, but I think the best thing was actually turning around and being able to look at my team. That, that moment, I'll, I'll never forget. Um, even if I can't remember the match at all or I never watched the match, um, that moment I'll never forget. So you've, you did, you've won the French Open semi in the Australian Open, fourth round in Wimbledon, the US Open, world number one. Right now, what do you dream of getting to with the rest of your career in tennis? Uh, my dream is winning Wimbledon, without a doubt. Um, and I think it took a long time for me to say that out loud. Uh, it took a long time for me to, to have the courage to say that out loud, but um, that's, that's what I want. That's, that's what I want to work towards. And I think being able to win junior Wimbledon was really special, but it just gave me a taste of, uh, of what it's really like. And I think that, that for me, um, that's the goal. Will there be an Olympic campaign for you in the future? Oh, I hope so. I really do. I was, I was devastated this year when, when Tokyo has obviously been delayed. Um, I think representing your country, no matter what sport you're in, no matter what profession you're in, 
representing um, Australia and wearing the green and gold, wearing Australia on your back uh, is the most special thing. It really is. I love playing Fed Cup. I love playing not just for myself, but for my team, um, for my family, for, for our country. I think it's, it's really special and I would love to be able to call myself an Olympian one day. Uh, at the moment, it's a pretty chaotic few months. Uh, the coronavirus has kind of thrown everything up in the air. How are you going? How are you dealing with it? Yeah, I think like everyone, I've had, I've had ups and downs. I've had weeks where I've been um, really motivated and, and really busy, and then I've had other weeks where you feel a bit flat. I think that's really normal, and I think that's, that's normal and you have to accept it. Um, because at the moment, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of unpredictability, there's a lot of uncertainty, and you can just kind of do your part. You can just play your role and, and do what you need to do. And I felt like um, that was a massive part for our team, was just accepting that this is, this is something greater than what we can control. We, we can't do anything about it. We just have to play our part and, and do the right thing from our, our point of view and our sense, um, and then hope that we get an opportunity um, sometime in the year to get back to some kind of normal, whatever that new normal may be, um, but get back to a point where, where we get to play tennis because it's, at the end of the day, there are a lot more things that are more important in life than, than hitting a tennis ball. And I think that's been a, a really important time to, to kind of bring that, that perspective um, you know, about health, your loved ones, family, all of these little things um, that, that people sometimes maybe take for granted. Can you tell me about the role that Yvonne Gould and Corley played in your, in your career or in your development? Yeah, Yvonne is such a special person. She's an incredible woman, um, obviously one of the most elegant and successful tennis players um, Australia's ever produced. And I think what's really special is that, that we share our heritage. Um, for me, that's just that that extra little something that, that we've got, that extra little connection. Um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to be able to call Yvonne a friend uh, and know that she's only ever a phone call away if, uh, if she's not busy out wedding a line or something and she doesn't pick up her phone. You are a Tennis Australia Indigenous uh, Tennis Ambassador. Uh, what does that entail? I think that's, that's a role for me where I can connect more with communities. Um, and uh, Yvonne has an incredible foundation where it's not just about getting kids involved, getting kids involved in tennis, it's also about education, um, allowing, allowing kids to have a pathway to follow and have a guideline to follow to, to become educated. Um, no matter where you come from, no matter um, what you may or may not have, um, you have access to be able to become educated. And I think in communities and in a lot of tribes around our country, uh, that's lacking. Uh, so I feel very, very privileged and very honoured to be able to, to share a little bit of that and to, to be able to help communities um, just that little bit and, and play my part because I feel like we, we are a family um, and uh, I know that there are so many communities and so many people out there, so many young Indigenous uh, boys and girls that deserve that opportunity. The way you praise Yvonne, has it sunk in that to an entire new generation, you are the next Yvonne? Uh, no, no. For me, um, Yvonne will always be uh, will always be Yvonne. Uh, she will always be um, the person who who put our our family, our our heritage, um, our uh, culture on the map. The recognition side of sport. Uh, you're now you're now Young Australian of the Year as well. On top of being everything else that's been accol <laughs> accoladed, the, uh, the Don recipient. The, um, how does all that fit on your shoulders? A little bit of me feel like it's, it's undeserving. I feel like there are so many more people um, that are more deserving of, of those accolades and I'm just trying to be the best version of myself. I'm, I'm just trying to be me. I'm start, trying to stay true to myself, to work hard and, and to try and achieve my dreams. Uh, and I feel very fortunate to, to have had um, a lot of accolades and a lot of uh, special, special extras along the way. I think I'm, I'm just, trying, just trying to do the best that I can every day, just trying to be the best version of myself and grow every day and, and feel very fortunate to, to be um, so lucky to be in that position. You, your sport, you're in a sport where it feels like the personalities are, are, are amplified yeah. and, and you've found success in it and yet you feel like, or at least the Australian community feel like, that you're still the person that we grew up with. How do, you stay, how do you stay so in touch with who you are when there are so many people telling you who you are or how amazing you are? Uh, I think, I feel like my, my true self is the best version of myself. 
there's, you get to a point where you feel comfortable in yourself and you go, okay, this is me. And it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I don't need to pretend to be anyone else that I'm not. Um, and, that, and that's all you can do. And I think, I know that if I want to play my best tennis, I have to be the best person that I can be um, because they, they, they definitely go hand in hand. And how does family fit into that as well? Uh, it's, it's the most important um, pillar for me. I think it really is. I, like I said, my, my sisters and my mum and dad, they're my go-to people for no matter what, whether it's um, the good, the bad, the ugly or anything in between, um, they're always my first port of call. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for... Uh, my sisters in particular, they, they gave me the opportunity to go and chase my dreams. They took a step back in their kind of young sporting careers uh, and young sporting love um, to give me the opportunity and I'm, I'm forever grateful to them uh, for that and, and mum and dad have been my biggest supporters from, from day dot and have taught me the values to, to live my life by uh, and I feel like they're, they're damn good values to live by. We see that in uh, the way you hold yourself in so many different arenas. Uh, there was a moment where you did a press conference with your little niece, Olivia. Yes. Beautiful moment. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd been able to share moments with um, my oldest niece, Lucy. She's walked out onto the court uh, a couple of times with me at Fed Cup and that brings the biggest smile to my face because we... There are a couple of my favourite photos where I've got Lucy in my arms, she's walking out on the court, her eyes are bright, she just loves it, like she loves it. And I think for me that made me smile and, and kind of being able to share that with her was really special. And yeah, that was... Uh, Olivia was, had just been born at the time, she was only a couple of months old. Um, okay. It was her first Australian Open, she came down and um, I thought, why not? Like, it's not something that I haven't done before, so it was, it was really cool to be able to do that with, with my next niece as well. How did you deal with the criticism that there was a, a few journalists that decided to uh, imply that that was a shield from criticism? A part of me was just like, are you... One, um, when I go into a press conference, I know I've got to answer questions, that's, that's kind of how it is. But as a journalist, if, if you can't ask a, a question because I'm holding a two-month-old niece in my arms, that's, I think that's an issue as well. I mean, we can have a conversation. I'm not going to avoid questions, I'll answer them. So I was, I was a bit disappointed in that in a sense of, for me, I feel like that's... Um, my family is such a massive part of my career and they've always been a massive part of my career and um, it, it kind of hurt me a little bit because I felt like um, if I'm not able to bring them and involve them in my career, I'm not going to be true to myself and I'm not going to be authentic. Um, but at the end of the day, it didn't, it didn't bother me too much because I'm still going to do it again. Um, I'm still going to involve my family in my career and in my life. I found a lot of sports stars who get caught up in the wins and losses and forget who they are. You've found excellence and you've stayed true to yourself. Thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Beauty. Thanks for having me, Kurt.